al nuovo webinar organizzato da Resfarma insieme con DSM. Eh, aspettiamo ancora qualche minuto affinché tutti gli iscritti possano partecipare e raggiungerci sulla piattaforma eh, per poi iniziare e dare la parola ai nostri ospiti. Bene, eh, direi che possiamo dare inizio alla presentazione. Eh, innanzitutto ringrazio i partecipanti e vi vorrei dare qualche nota tecnica prima di dare la parola ai nostri ospiti di DSM. Eh, il webinar verrà registrato e riceverete il link eh, da cui potrete accedere alla registrazione e quindi alla presentazione. Eh, ci fa piacere rendere la presentazione interattiva durante questo webinar, quindi eh, avrete la possibilità eh, di porre domande attraverso la chat box che vedete nella piattaforma in alto a destra. Eh, le domande verranno poste durante eh, la presentazione, quindi in ogni momento vi sentite eh, potete appunto scriverle e eh, alla fine della presentazione eh, farò un sommario delle domande eh, che verranno poste ai nostri speaker. Eh, ho il piacere eh, in questo momento di introdurre e dare il via al webinar dal titolo trend eh, da osservare e da eh, tenere presente nel 2022 e le loro espressioni nel mercato cinese e americano. Ehm, quindi trend che vedremo in un futuro prossimo visti dalla prospettiva di DSM nei mercati eh, che sono diciamo, al di fuori del mercato europeo, quello in cui noi siamo eh, inseriti. E abbiamo quindi il piacere di avere con noi a parlarcene direttamente dalla Cina, quindi live, Amanda Zhang, Regional Marketing Manager Personal Care, eh, dagli Stati Uniti Cara Kini, Marketing and Sales Coordinator Nord America eh, e Enrico, Enrico Ramos, Global Consumer and Marketing Insights Manager Personal Care che in questo momento si trova in Svizzera, nella sede eh, di DSM europea. Eh, do il benvenuto ai nostri speaker. Welcome to uh, Amanda, Cara e Enrico. Thanks for being with us today and share your knowledge uh, about new trends in personal care in your markets. I leave, I leave you the virtual stage. Thanks for uh, joining us. Grazie, Nadia. And that's the end of my Italian. Sorry for that. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm glad to be here. And also want to thank my colleagues, Amanda and Cara. They are in very opposite place in the globe. So I do thank them for accepting this challenge of presenting, share a little bit of trends with you uh, from their perspective from China and also the US. So yeah, let's get it started. And before we jump into the trends, I'd like to put everybody on the same page when it comes to consumer trends. And that's the definition. We understand that DSM, what a consumer trend is. So in a nutshell, it's a new manifestation among people in behavior, attitude, or expectation of a human basic need, want or desire that have been awakened by a driver of change. Let me better explain to you this with this chart here. So we have basically three fundamental elements of any trends. The first one we call global drivers. These are mark forces that change the business arena, the way we uh, deal with business, okay? We have basically two global drivers. 
shifts long-term macro change, such as urbanization, age population, climate change. And these global drivers here, they play out across years or even decades. So long-term ones. Then we have triggers. These are more immediate change, like the pandemics, COVID that burst out a couple of months ago, like two years ago. So they are more immediate, uh, political events, economic shock, technology, all this. One thing that I would like to highlight here, and you see in the coming slides, that these global drivers here, they are not trains, okay? They are drivers that influence the second element of our uh, framework here, the fundamental elements, basic needs. So we, as human beings, all the time we want to fulfill our needs. Doesn't matter what type of uh, needs we have. We want to belong. We want to entertain ourselves. We want to have more simple things. We want to protect ourselves, right? So all the time we look for fulfilling our basic needs that are awakened by these global drivers here. And between these two elements, we have expectations gap. Something happens there, we want to fulfill our needs. So is in here where trends emerge, okay? That's the dynamic. And then we have the third element, which is a very important one, innovations. And again, innovations are not trends, okay? Innovations are solutions that are meant to solve this tension here between global drivers and uh, human needs, basic needs. We have different types of innovations. We can have innovations like new startups, services, product, experiences, campaign, and also ingredients, okay? These are the three elements of any trends. We have some innovations that are more of the same. They solve the basic need, but they don't address a global driver. So it's okay. Uh, it's like nice to have. On the other hand, we have, you know, some innovations that solve this global drive, but doesn't address our needs. So we need to really hit the sweet spot. And we, as DSM, we are all the time trying uh, to launch, to develop, to provide solutions that hit the sweet spot. So these are the dynamics, okay? Let's move on here. One example that just happened, COVID. So COVID is a global driver, is a trigger one. And when that happened, it awakened our basic needs. The first ones were back in that time, protection, and we want this feeling of feeling safe and healthy. So we look for solutions, not the best one at that moment, to protect us and make us safer, right? Like wash your hands, social distance and wear masks. We did have a novelty vaccine. Now it's kind of going towards the heat spot, but I don't think it's still in there because you know, the third, fourth wave, I don't know, which number now it's coming again here in Europe. So cases are increasing. So it's not a proper uh, innovation. So this is an example, okay? Let's now move it to this. So the world is in constant change. And one thing influences the other, then influences the other, and there is a response. So this is change all the time. We cannot isolate anything here, right? It's only one thing. But sometimes we feel that we are kind of overwhelmed by information. There's too much information out there that we cannot qualify, we cannot distinguish what is noise from signal, right? That's the feeling about all these things going on out there. But we, as DSM, we have a solution that does help us identify what is signal and help us also to avoid what is noise because noise distracts us, right? So let's go back to the global drivers. Now we monitor more or less 15 global drivers. And uh, for instance, you see here global pandemic, it's COVID here. We have monitored these uh, global drivers constantly all the time uh, through different sources of information. We also are monitoring age population, digitalization, pollution, middle cloud disruption, all these global drivers, right? We have uh, tools to monitor it. These global drivers influence basic needs, human needs, and you can see this represented by the arrow. So when you have a very thin arrow, the influence of this global driver in the strand is slow, it's not so strong. Thicker arrows, that is more strong, stronger, right? 
And the last but not the least piece of this framework is the trends. There are right now five macro trends that we are constantly monitoring and updated and all their expressions. We have now more or less 24 trends. Uh, microbiome beauty, instant beauty, resilient beauty, conscious beauty, all these trends are right now influencing consumers' behavior, okay? So that's our framework. Uh, and COVID, as we know, uh, has strongly influenced uh, some global drivers like digitalization. We are here in front of our screens, uh, running our meetings, deliver our webinars, interact with our customers. So this is one of the most uh, influenced and accelerated one over the last two years. And we do have a couple of trends that also have been accelerated by COVID. Okay, in today's session, we'd like to cover three trends that we believe will continue next year and will change a little bit on how uh, consumers behave. Power of me, all about uh, personalization, resilient to be, a resilient beauty, sorry, and then conscious beauty. So we'll be covering these three trends and my colleagues will jump in sharing their uh, examples from their regions. Okay, let me continue here. So power of me, the first one. As I told you before, this is all about personalization, about having product that really uh, meet consumers' needs. So we, we, we have seen that there's no more boundaries uh, between consumers and suppliers. All the time, consumers want to have very, very tailor-made solutions. And they expect brands also to deliver this exactly to their needs. So this is power of me. And if you could take one word away from this, slide is personalization, right? This is happening. This has been accelerated by COVID and next year will be even stronger. And we can see uh, there's a large majority of users that would pay, look at this, would pay a premium price for personalized solutions, 85% of consumers. They are willing to pay if you know this solution would meet their needs specifically. This is from 2019, but yet it's still up to date, right? So we have a couple of dates here. 68% of US have not found the right facial moisturizer for their skin. So uh, as you can see, uh, brands are not fully fulfilling consumers' needs. So that's why personalization and power of me is becoming even more strong. Uh, but how the solutions are delivered, I think that's the, the, the key point here. So we can deliver solutions in, in terms of diagnosis, degrees of personalization. So we could fill in a very simple form or you could chat with a chatbot or you could take yourself maybe run lab tests, your DNA, microbiome, hormonal. So this is the decrease of personalization when it comes to diagnosis, right? So we have more oral one going to physical examination. So that's one angle of the delivery. The other one, we could say that how products are delivered. So for instance, we could have existing products, very simple one, straightforward, but fully bespoke one. When you put these two uh, axes together, we have this uh, chart here. We can see that there are some brands like Ubiome, SkinCeuticals, Neutrogena, that they are playing in a very sophisticated way. So high level degree of diagnosis and also product delivery. But we have seen some important brands like La Roche-Posay and Vichy also trying to tackle these consumer needs. Uh, the last slide I'm going to hand over to Amanda for a couple of minutes. Uh, we could cluster all those brands that we have seen in the market. And as an ingredient supplier, we would be more or less here uh, in terms of product delivery, right? So have technological supplies, skincare brands, and retailers. But that's more or less a dynamics about uh, power of me. So let me now hand over to Amanda for her to share a little bit of this expression in China. Amanda, over to you. Thank you, Andrigo. Yeah, um, for us, for our region, I think that uh, personalization has always been tried by uh, many companies, brands, 
but it has been uh, further developed uh, since these years. So one of the reasons or the motivation behind is that uh, there are more and more younger generation has becoming the consumers. They have the purchasing power. And for these groups of Gen Z, let's say, each of them consider themselves as very different. And also that maybe in the past, you would consider China a little bit more conservative, like everyone is holding their ideas or opinions. But nowadays it's really totally different. I think that society is comparatively open and people are encouraged to express their own ideas, opinions, and to show different characters. And people are tend to also embrace better the diversity. So, um, and that triggers more for each of us that we hope that the product is tailor-made. And how that is realized uh, by the brands, the most um, applied solutions, I think, is combined with AI or, let's say, AR, um, or with many applications that you can just achieve by your mobile phone uh, with you. Um, the, the attractive picture you see with the different lipsticks colors, um, I also experienced it myself that when you purchase online and you are struggling with what color, then uh, you can jump into some AR and, and then you can just use the camera and you can choose different colors and you can see how the color goes with your with yourself on your on your on your lips and that can um, help consumers to choose the right one or the one they really enjoy. Um, that used a lot with the color cosmetics. Even in the store, there is a AR mirror that you can go there and you can try different um, um, the, the, the eyeshadows, etc. And the other one is with the skincare part. Um, you can see the 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 summer uh, the spring summer brand. So this is a brand owned by Jala Group. Uh, so Jala is quite a leading cosmetics group in China, and spring summer is dedicated to the younger generation of Gen Z. Um, they have like um, so in China that uh, WeChat is a very many functional uh, application. So in inside then you can just take a picture of yourself and then it will provide you diagnosis of your skin type. And then uh, the account will recommend you that what kind of products you can choose to treat yourselves um, to, to solve your skin problems. Um, and similarly, the other one you can see with the, 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 the logo next to it, Beauty Evolution. Um, this is a platform application that provides lots of the ingredients knowledges, as well as as a, pr a platform that you can also purchase um, different skincare products from different brands. So uh, in the middle of the picture, you can also see again. So this is myself. So I use the mobile phone to take a picture of my skin. And then it will diagnose us to see that, uh, like, what is your skin looks like? What age you looks like based on your skin condition? Um, and uh, what is the color and the pigment, uh, pigmentation, um, tightening and the wrinkles show on it. So based on that, it will give you many um, suggestions. And it would also remember your skin type. So in the later that when you search or look into the articles, et cetera, on the platforms, then it would based on your skin type and give you lots of the, um, or treat you that's what contents might, uh, might fit you and you might be interested. And also it will recommend to you what products that may fit you, especially highlighting the ingredients that can like retinol for your wrinkles, um, nice in my PC for lightening your skin, etc. So um, I think because of the regulatory that to realize the real tailor-made products will continue to be a challenge. I think not only in China, but in other countries maybe as well. But I think it will be continued explored uh, by the brands and try to achieve maybe later on with more advanced technology. Thank you. That's sharing from my side. And I pass it to Kara. Hi, thank you. Um, you know, I think in the U.S. we're seeing the similar growth in personalization. Um, you see a 2020 Euro Monitor survey that showed that 36% of global consumers can now be considered digital beauty shoppers, um, and 41% of consumers seek personalized hair care solutions. So there's just some figures there that uh, represent that. Uh, recent data shows that more consumers look for products online. And the brands with the strong digital presence, you know, are experiencing the growth. Next slide. Um, so the smartphone beauty apps and the digitalization of beauty care purchasing 
has opened the door for mainstreaming the personalization movement. And of course, with COVID, when we couldn't go to stores and try things, we reverted to our phones and our computers. Um, so that shopping that we did, we started doing, of course, more online for skin, hair care, and color cosmetics. And so the, the websites that have the interaction that we're looking for, um, they allow us to shop by our skin types and our hair types or by the concerns that we have for our skin. And that allows the consumer to complete Sometimes we can complete the questionnaire, and as Amanda was showing, that we can look look actually at our skin tone and our skincare needs for the best products for our skin. Um, so that kind of transforms the consumer into an active participant in the product creation. Um, the example that I could see um, down here, she spoke, is this brand that you can actually you fill out a questionnaire about um, the colors that you like. They put up pictures that um, show the different colors and intensities and moods. Um, you match it with your skin tone and you actually get to select um, the, the type of lipstick you're looking for, if it's matte or if it's glossy, if it's creamy, and then you actually receive that product um, later and you, you've you made that product. So it's taking it to a, um, a very bespoke, um, experience for the consumer. We also have Curology, um, which is a skincare brand where you can um, complete a questionnaire. You can chat with an expert. Um, you can uh, find out exactly what you need uh, for your skin, and then you get that product. And so it's taking, it's, it's, it's like going to a dermatologist, but you're going for your skincare. Um, and then finally, we have Madison Reed, which before the pandemic was a fantastic brand that I actually use for my own hair uh, care for the color. But during the pandemic, it became one of the few ways that people could, could get that color. And so when you go to Madison Reed, you fill out a questionnaire about hair texture, hair length, um, the thickness of your hair the current color of your hair, whether it's natural or dyed, and then the color you want to achieve. And I can tell you from personal experience that you get the color that you're looking for, as opposed to going into a store and picking out a box color and hoping um, that the color is going to work for you or going to a salon and paying an exorbitant amount of money for, for that. And so that's become the norm in our shopping experience so that we have um, the consumer in the driver's seat and the, the, our experience as the consumer and what the, the customers are finding um, with our products and with the selection. And think of in the past where you have a drawer full of beauty products that you don't use, the lipstick that looks horrible on you but looks great on your best friend or the you know, this skincare routine that you thought would be wonderful for you, but makes you break out or dries out your skin. And instead, what we're finding are um, products that are much more valuable to the consumer. They're willing to pay more for it because it's going to work for them. And it's also helping um, kind of drive the boat for um, the ingredient suppliers and the, and the, the people selling the product to actually create better products for the consumer. So it's definitely a trend that's going to continue, especially as the, the new next generation is coming with their money. This is something they're expecting. It's something that they're used to and it's more natural for them. And so this is definitely a trend that will be growing. Thank you, Cara. Thank you, Amanda. Good. Let's move to the second one, resilient beauty. And we know that, you know, life uh, is not sometimes happens when we like it to, to happen. We have problems, we have issues, and this trend uh, is all about overcoming such obstacles that, you no, know, uh, coming out of the blue, like because of COVID, uh, and in order for us to recover and also bounce back stronger than before. Some key words here that we relate to this one is essential care, repair, recovery, prevention, and most importantly, adaptation. So this is resilient beauty. We need to be resilient uh, when anything or everything uh, doesn't happen like we would like to. So this is resilient beauty. And also for you to understand where 
resilient beauty has come from. Uh, again, let's imagine a, a chart and next the vertical one with signal strength of the trend and also consumer needs. And here horizontally, we have the years, uh, years going by. Uh, well, let me push this one. So resilient beauty had always been there before COVID. But what happened is that when we had COVID, COVID accelerated this trend, you know, kind of push it to a very, very high level in terms of a signal. Now, yeah, resident beauty is the top. It doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have other trends uh, like conscious beauty, preventive beauty, e-beauty. Yes, we will have these trends next year, but resilient beauty will be one of the most important ones. Okay, so this is the context about resilient beauty. And we have observed that resilient beauty has twofold approach in terms of attitudes, behaviors, and also, I had something more, right? Yeah, attitudes and behaviors. So we see that consumers now, they are urging for moments of relaxation. And they, are, they, they like to kind of rescue that routines that will bring them more comfort. That's the recovery part of the resilient beauty. Uh, some implications here, we have, for instance, skincare products that detox, alleviate stress and help recover. Uh, for example, anti-stress face masks. I think we have seen a lot of launches uh, in anti-stress face creams. Serums that fight mask issues as well. That's a very strong manifestation of the strength and also implication in the beauty personal care industry. Also we have rituals that bring to sort of experience and sense of calmness. And the last but not the least, efficient solutions on their pin bite size. So this is one approach, one fold. Uh, we do have uh, data and figures to underpin and support these implications and the beauty in personal care industry, right? These are only some of them. On the other hand, we have the prevention uh, where consumers urge science innovation to support the future. So they are consumer more sustainably to boost their health and immunity. Solutions, biotechnology. Uh, this is something really important in the coming years. So upcycle ingredients, environmental friendly technology, and you see here again, personalized products. So if we put all together, we have these two fold. So the recovery part of it, let's look back and recover from what ha happened. And then we look uh, to the future and try to uh, prevent that the same things uh, happen again to us. Uh, this is a twofold uh, trend. And now let me pass over to Amanda. Amanda, over to you. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, when talking about resilient beauty, I think definitely for China, the very clear pattern as Andrew has just showed is sensitive skin. And here you can see that already back in um, 2019, we have conducted an interview both with uh, uh, some uh, dermatologists as well as with the, uh, with the uh, consumers who are having sensitive skins. So based on the dermatologists' uh, uh, feedback that actually they have also observed so during past years, the diseases connected with the sensitive skin has been increasing greatly um, comparing with the, uh, well, happening in the past decades. So, um, and also nowadays that uh, because of the COVID situation, um, the, and, and in China, as you may know that uh, it is really strictly to ask you to wear masks during the lockdown uh, last year. And, uh, and also as of today, when you go into public areas, like in subway, a uh, bus or shopping mall some, uh, somewhere, you have to wear masks. So and it worsened the situation um, and we call it like the mask, mask face. So that brings lot, lots of the challenges to um, people already have sensitive skin. And even for people who actually used to have the normal skin, but then now they have the sensitive syndromes. Um, so um, we have seen this uh, trend has been increasing uh, even as of today. So now whatever the brands, when, it, when you're talking about anti-aging hydration or like the acne treatment, etc., then first they will also claim that it is uh, user-friendly for sensitive skin. Um, then uh, some of the insights we can look into that based on the suggestion from the doctors and also the habits uh, and behaves that presented by the patients is that 
Um, because people have sensitive skin and then they consider like the pollution, the pressure outside, and also they will wear makeups as well. So they will even use stronger products to clean their faces every day uh, after they, they back home. But the doctors actually suggest them that to uh, not to clean so much. And they will also suggest them that not to use so many skincare products. Um, but so that is the gap uh, between uh, what people who do have sensitive skin uh, syndromes that they have to do and what is actually their behavior is that to show. So um, now when uh, brands are talking about that uh, uh, their products suitable for sensitive skin uh, consumers, they were highlighting they use the ingredients that is strengthening the skin barriers, user friendly, or for the cleansing products they will clean, they will use the formulation that is for mild cleansing. So this is one of the um, let's say insights that we have observed in the product side. And the next page, thank you. We can see there are uh, two other uh, parts, uh, messages I wanted to share. So one is the product itself. Like we interviewed all of, uh, we interviewed the sensitive skin uh, consumers and all of them have said that the, the must have SKU is the water spray. So Avian, as I show here is the brand most of them they would use. And normally they will keep one bottle at home, normally in the fridge, and the other one that they will take it in the office time. Because for them, sometimes they will have sudden syndromes, like because they're exposed to the sun or too long time in the uh, in the room with the uh, air conditioning, then they will have this redness, itchiness, uh, warming feelings. So the first action they will do is to use the spray uh, to apply on their face. Then that will provide immediate soothing effect it will cool down their faces feelings. So if we look into the brand dedicated for sensitive skin, that water spray is, is a must have SKU in all of these brands. And the other one is the brand called Winona. Um, this is a local brand. And as you can see that it is just founded in 2008, but since past two years, the performances of this brand is really, really strong. And just uh, during the past double 11, so it's an online uh, festival uh, in China, um, the top 20 brands that has um, um, best sold during double 11 festival, we, I think we only have two to three national brands this year. And we know that is one of them, which is really a great achievement. Um, and they are dedicated to sensitive skin. They have been really growing greatly in the past year, capturing the sensitive skin trend. And what they have done is also they, um, I, I don't know, but they have kind of collaboration with uh, hospitals because like one of a colleague that uh, she visited uh, the hospital, the doctor, after the uh, doctor will prescribe her some of the medicines to treat the face. And the doctor will also suggested her to use the Winona sunscreen for protection from UV exposure. So if, we or any one of you are interested in the market here, then um, for products, whether it's for sensitive skin or not, but uh, for caring of this part of the consumers, definitely can be a value added to your brands and products. That's my sharing, thank you. Hi, um, so in the US, uh, of course, everything was influenced by the pandemic. And one of the things that we saw um, arriving was the um, importance and the resurgence in the self-care routine. And the beauty care aspect of that became quite important. Um, so if you look at some figures, you can see, um, you know, 50% of U.S. consumers are interested in trying some products that protect the microbiome and how the microbiome, you know, in the U.S., it started with the gut microbiome, and, and now we're looking at it in all aspects, and people are starting to really understand the importance of the microbiome with healthy skin. And so, especially as it's um, our first line of defense with immunity. Um, and then in a survey, 60% uh, of U.S. consumers um, like to take a preventative approach for beauty and skin care. Um, next slide. And so the, the self-care routine, the beauty routine that we saw, um, saw it online, saw it with the products and the things that we're really starting to see with Resilient Beauty is 
it's about prevention. It's about protection. Um, it's it's no longer just having moisturized skin. It's about having protected skin, and it's um, the ingredients that are arriving during this time that are coming to prominence are effective, but also seen as something that's uh, more legitimate and more healthy, like a vitamin, for instance. So our expanded um, skincare routines during the global pandemic, um, the increase in products such as cleansers and moisturizers and exfoliators and scrubs, people really taking the time to, to cleanse their skin, take care of it, then the products that promote the nourishment of the skin and strengthening the barrier. Um, so the, the different um, the ways we protect the skin. And then the familiar ingredients that we use, um, vitamin C, of course, and niacin, my PC, and retinol have all come into the forefront again as being proven and not, you know, giving the, the feeling of natural and, and um, nourishing. And then we see also the brands that have done really well this past um, few years, the derma cosmetic brands like Aquaphor, Eucerin, and CeraVe are well known um, and they're trusted. And they're also, you know, they're known for like being very caring for your skin. Um, one of our examples here, um, Layers Immunity Moisturizer, it nourishes the skin while it uh, boosts its immunity. It um, increases microflora diversity. I would say most consumers don't understand what that means, but it, um, it's very reassuring. Um, and it contains panthenol. So one of the things that we've seen is that the labeling for the products, they call out the vitamins that are in there um, on the label and they, they speak about them um, as if, you know, how important they are. Um, for beauty counter, um, it calls out vitamin C and E and hyaluronic acid. I uh, believe the consumers are becoming much more informed with these ingredients. When consumers had um, would go to the store and they would buy their product, they were they were smelling and touching, and you know seeing the packaging. And during the pandemic, the consumer went online, and so they became much more educated as to the ingredients that went in and what they were looking for. And they were influenced by influencers who were promoting um, these ingredients. And, you know, so the consumers are now looking for them on the packaging so that they have a reason to believe in these products. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. I think I might have heard something in my neighborhood. Again, really here, sorry for that. Uh, so the next one is uh, Resilient Beauty. Uh, actually, yes. Sorry, one second. Yeah, this one, sorry. Uh, actually, it's one example. Uh, we designed, develop a lineup uh, with two subsets. The, the first one is uh, Blissful Treat and Recovery. Contains four products, and we try to highlight everything, uh, addressing, you know, the trend. Uh, the resident beauty one and also have the second set of this lineup called blissful treat and prevention uh, with four products as well with you know our ingredients if you are interested just uh, get in touch with this pharma and you can ask uh, uh, more information about these lineups but the idea here is to address uh, resilient beauty so going to the last one conscious beauty and this is all about having uh, the consumers in the drive seat so all the time they are asking questions about uh, the solutions, the brand. So what is in it? How does it work? Is it really good for me? And how does it fit with my personal values? This is about to be even more conscious and even more empowered uh, through the you know tools that we have now in our hands, like our mobile, so we can check information all the time at end time. So consumers are becoming even more aware of their choices. And some keywords, under this uh, trend, knowledge, conscious transparency is something really important. Traceability as well, so they do want to know where the ingredient ingredients come from. And another uh, word that we have uh, seen on social media is less is more. So again, we we are trying to become even more. We I say as a consumer as well, we are trying to become even more conscious about our purchasing process and also our choices. 
And some examples, uh, yeah, Gen Z and millennials, uh, they have everything in, in their hands. So they can search for information, they can judge, they can post, and they can influence. But also uh, they are willing to spend uh, more time on products uh, that act responsibly. They also believe that climate change uh, is largely a result for human activity. So we are the responsible uh, for this change. Uh, but yeah, uh, they are every time trying to judge and to care the food, uh, choose their options that you know brands are launching all the time. Most importantly, they will change their behavior because they will become even more conscious. Uh, and we have uh, started as a consumers from a, an industrial society where we just uh, wanted to have our needs satisfied in a very rational way. And we are moving, consumers are, are moving to a more creative society where they want to contribute also to a higher good. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we will forget about the previous uh, benefits. So we want rational benefits by satisfying our needs, we want emotional benefits uh, as well by elevating us as individual and the last but not the least societal benefits, which means contributes to a very high level. So this is how the conscious consumer, consumers, I mean, it are moving uh, towards a more conscious uh, purchasing power. Uh, and it's all about looking at a, a social responsibility point of view and also purpose. And these two uh, end goals will be connected with uh, the choices that consumers will be uh, make uh, in, in, made in the, the coming future. So, yeah. Let me now pass on to Amanda for her to bring some insights from China. Thank you. Um, I think that for conscious beauty expressed in China, um, there are different two angles, I would say. So one part is you can see here, uh, that is also connected with the people's environment uh, uh, awarenesses that has been increasing in China. Uh, you can see that this data is coming from uh, Kenta. So we can see the uh, the percentage of people, as we call equal actives, has increased a percentage. While that uh, uh, for shoppers that uh, uh, who are really neglecting or they don't really care about this social responsibility has decreased for 11 percentage. And if go to the next page. Yeah, so sorry, no, the previous one. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. And and then this is one part that we can see the increase of people's awarenesses regarding the uh, the environmental protection, and the other part a strong strong uh, uh, signal is that uh, for people who are focusing more on the efficacy of a product. So here you can see this is a survey done by a uh, third party again to uh, p uh, for the consumers that you can see here that eighty seven point four percentage consumers will repurchase or trust a product if it brings extraordinary effect proven by personal experiences. This means that consumers nowadays in China, they don't really only believe in the advertisement or the celebrities that who claim that this product has very good um, performances, that treatment or whatever. Um, and also the loyalty of Chinese consumers no nowadays are very low because there are too many choices. So they will try maybe for the first time, but if it don't really bring the visible effects, tangible effects, then they will give it up and they will go to other brands. Um, so this is very important. And the other one is that they also require brands to be more transparent. So um, again, that close to 80% of consumers, they expect brands to provide uh, more testing data of re relevant ingredients that provide efficacy. Because in the past that some of the brands, they will claim they use that this peptide or retin or whatever, but actually the dosage used in the formulation is really, really low. They only use that ingredient for claiming. But nowadays that consumers are also getting more smarter that they will require that brands to prove, you said you have this peptide, then show me what is the percentage and what is the percent and, and, and also you have to be conformed because they know that maybe like for only you when you add for one percentage of the peptide then you will bring real performances 
So that is the two ways that I, that I have observed for the uh, Chinese consumers' uh, expression in the uh, conscious beauty. And if we go to the next page, it is an example that of a brand called PMPM. I find it's quite interesting and would like to share with you. So I think this one you can see, uh, this is a new brand as well. I think it's founded only in two years, but they also have gained uh, their own uh, popularity among consumers. Um, this brand was, um, I think, established during or just before the COVID. What they have done interesting is that because the brand owner is a um, likes traveling around the world, so you can see here is their formulation um, formula. So X plus Y plus Z. So with the X, they choose global natural ingredients um, because they enjoy traveling. So they will do live streaming and also to introduce like for this product, I use maybe the roses from Bulgaria. And for each of the product, they will have a signature natural ingredients. And they will introduce a little bit of the uh, the, the environment, the interesting part, the scene of the of the of the country or of the areas, the regions where this ingredient is coming from, this natural, the plants, the flowers are coming from. So getting some emotional connection with the consumers. And the second is the why, that is the scientific ingredient. And they will choose uh, maybe like the peptides, um, biotechnology products, vitamins that really drives for um, convincing efficacy. And also that will provide or, or persuading the consumer's belief that this product brings real efficacy. And then the last one is the leading technology. Then that is with uh, their own formulation uh, technology, et cetera. So in the future, I also uh, expect that more brands will adopt a similar concept. So not only using full natural ingredients or only go with the peptides or vitamins driving for efficacy. They may do a smart combination and also having some of their own innovations. So in a way to meet consumers aspiration in the natural and the other way is also to meet their aspiration for really having efficacy products. Thank you. In the US, um, I'd say the ingredients are top of mind. Um, a recent survey by N uh, NPD shows that 68% of consumers seek brands that are using clean ingredients and uh, the retailers are definitely responding. Um, Whole Foods, a uh, big brand here, um, they have a premium body care line that will exclude ingredients um, that include nanoparticles, oxybenzone, parabens, BHA, BHT, um, our major retailer, Target, uh, they utilize a special clean beauty symbol to mark their products that don't contain oxybenzone, polyparabens, butylparabens, triclosan, and other ingredients that consumers may not. Um, Credo has a dirty list that includes over 2,700 ingredients. And all the retailers, um, they'll have a clean beauty section of their, of their aisle so that the consumers know where to go to find those um, products that are clean. Um, and they continue to update these lists to include more ingredients to respond to consumer demands. Um, whatever at the, you know, we have a lot of ingredients that, um, you know, once they get into the public perception that they're not clean anymore, they need to come out of the products. This is a big focus here in the U.S. Um, so clean beauty in the U.S. Um, reflects a more mindful approach to beauty selection. And um, our consumers have indicated that they are more interested in the efficacy, transparency, and wellness with an increased attention on the ingredient content clinical products that utilize natural ingredients. So they're clean, but they're efficacious. Um, they focus on biotechnology, um, that this is trending in the region. So we have um, sustainability also top of mind with as far as packaging and the ingredients um, and also um, the supply chain as well. During the pandemic, when consumers, again, they can no longer browse the aisles and try the different products, they focus their attention, as we saw before, on the ingredients and, you know, the not just the ingredients and the, the packaging and also the companies that they were buying from. 
wanting them to be good for themselves and good for the planet. Um, so we have brand beauty, uh, love, beauty, and planet. It's a, it has a little bit of whimsy, a little bit of playfulness in the brand, but uh, they focus on being cruelty-free and vegan. They use 100% recycled and recycled uh, product bottles, and they are ethically sourced fragrances in the products. Um, so that's a that's a big push on that brand. We also have Ethique. Um, they are the fastest selling shampoo and conditioner brand on Amazon. They focus on plastic free packaging and shipping, and they produce solid bars to reduce water usage. And that is, you know, definitely becoming a trend here. Uh, for our products. They're looking at a whole new way of um, imagining the products that we use so that um, our behaviors aren't impacting the planet. And um, finally, we have Goop, a big important brand. Um, th this brand highlights the growing marriage between clean and powerful. Um, Goop Glow is a, a combines two skincare powerhouses that are called out for being the purest and the best for skin. And that's L-ascorbic acid. Um, and they, they say an ingredient that's naturally present in the body, again, calling out the natural um, quality of the ingredient, hyaluronic acid. And they're saying it's, it's maximizing the potency and the freshness of the product. And so that's what we're seeing for uh, Conscious Beauty. It, it's encompassing everything from the ingredients themselves to um, the, the packaging and how it's affecting the body and how it's affecting the planet. And I think along with the other trends that we've discussed today, it's just, it's showing a much more mindful approach to our beauty routines and um, definitely a trend we're gonna see going into the future. Thank you, Kara. Yeah, and with that, I think we ran a couple of minutes over the time. So if you have any questions, comments, please feel free to ask or write in the chat. Let me stop sharing my screen. I think that's the best way now. That... Good, yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Amanda, Kara, and Rigo for the very informative presentation sharing with us uh, your experience in your market about trends, uh, the new coming trends. Um, ora abbiamo l'opportunità nei prossimi minuti di porre delle domande ai nostri ospiti sulla loro esperienza eh, sul mercato e sul trend eh, nei loro paesi. Abbiamo appunto discusso trend in Cina negli Stati Uniti. Quindi abbiamo l'opportunità, l'occasione unica, più unica che rara, di eh, presentare, di porre delle domande. Eh, quindi apro la sessione domande, ehm, vi appunto ricordo che potete scriverla nella chat e così rispondono live. Um, so, thank you very much, we have opened the Q&A session. Uh, Thanks for the opportunity to ask you some question about uh, your markets. Uh, I can start with a question. Uh, first, I tell it in, in Italian. Uh, la domanda, la mia curiosità è uh, come DSM trova, uh, va a cercare i nuovi trend sul mercato a livello globale. So uh, the question is uh, in English, uh, uh, how DSM finds new trends uh, in personal care worldwide on a global level yeah thank you for the question Adia. so we have different sources of information uh, such as Euromonitor, Mintel we also look for academic articles to see if there's something more trendy coming up we also have magazines websites uh, that we monitor all the time so uh, we put all this information together and you try to understand the patterns if this is something that is not only uh, found in China and US, but we can find different places. If we find these patterns in different places, we highlight as a uh, rising trend. Otherwise, you just park it. Uh, we don't forget about it, just park it. So that's how we uh, try to spot new trends, by having different inputs and trying to identify the same patterns in different parts of the world. Have I answered your question? 
Yes, yeah. of course. Thanks. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I have a second question so that I ask uh, all of you. Um, my curiosity, first I tell in, in Italian. No? So la curiosità è di sapere come DSM eh, dà un servizio ai propri clienti a livello globale. Cioè in che modo eh, supportate ehm, la, la clientela, quindi eh, chi acquista i vostri ingredienti, eh, cioè, che cosa da, potete dare in più come, come fornitore di ingredienti sul mercato. So uh, the question is, uh, how uh, does DSM serve uh, customers uh, worldwide? Uh, so what kind of uh, service uh, you have uh, in different markets? Uh, I can start briefly, then I can hand over uh, to the region. Uh, so we do have a couple of services, actually six services. For instance, we have a sensory panel in Basel where our customers uh, could send uh formulations or prototypes to be tested uh we also have our scientific lab in kaiser august we have a area called cdc uh, customer documentation center which supports also our customer when it comes to uh, documentation and we do have a um, global application presence so we have labs in america in the americas in the EMEA and also asia passive but I, I'd like to also give some minutes for Kara to contribute with her answer here. I think we're on mute. I am on yeah. mute. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have one of the things that we like to do with our distributors and some of our customers is bring them into our formulations lab and work on um, with our different products, looking at different textures and product formats and some new ideas and new ingredients. So it's educational. It's a way for us to create together. Um, and it, we have definitely found it to be quite good for our distributors to bring them in there. It influences them to what they're showing uh, their customers. And with our larger customers, it's a way to really promote our materials and co-create with them. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Nadia, if, if you allow me, I think there is a very interesting question from Alessandra Bertelli. Yes. I think it's for Indeed. Cara. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. For Cara, there is a question for you. So is the global vision in US homogeneous or can we find different trends from East Coast to West Coast? That's a really great question. I would say uh, yes to both. Um, there is definitely a difference between, uh, I would say, the West Coast and the rest of the country. Um, it's a very different personality on the West Coast. But yeah, you would find uh, the weather plays a big role in that um, as far as needs um, for skin, for sure. We also have income playing a big factor in that and lifestyle. Um, but what I'm also seeing... Um, can you hear me now? I can. Okay. What I'm also seeing is that the internet and social media is definitely bringing those differences, uh, decreasing those differences as we're um, experiencing each other um, more intimately and we're, there's not such a divide anymore. But it's so it's definitely there, but it's not as the difference aren't as big as they were before. Uh, I think we lost Nadia. Let me yes. take this over. Do you see anything different in China, Amanda, from east to west as well? Um, similarly, as Kara mentioned, because also China has uh, um, is, is quite big that uh, uh, from south to China, uh, to north, that people's behavior, the weather, etc., is far different. And the other differences I observed is for the big cities and all and, and well, definitely lost them. <laughs> but but yeah, for for small towns, it's it's very different. Okay. Yeah. So let, I think we are approaching the end of the presentation as well. It's almost three <laughs> o'clock. I know Nadia is not here, but I will try to wrap up. So thank you so much for your participation. Uh, I hope you like the presentation, the content that we have delivered. If you feel like having access to the presentation, any question, please 
uh, get in touch with Nadia or with Carmina, Carmina as well. So, okay. yeah, thank you so much. I think we can close it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye -bye. Okay. Nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao.